sense. Without program. So what we have next on our agenda is a presentation on youth radicalization in South Asia. And we're very happy to have with us Mr. Chirindak Thapa. Uh, Mr. Thapa is the regional security advisor for Asia and Oxfam, which is one of the largest INGOs in the world. Prior to this role, he worked as an independent security and defense consultant. He was the Regional Security and Justice Advisor for Safer Worlds Asia program from 2013 to 2016. And prior to that, has also worked with the Asia Foundation in Kathmandu, and also with the permanent missions of Singapore and Nepal to the United Nations in New York. He has also served with the World Bank and IFC in Macedonia, and the Institute of International Education in New York. He currently teaches various courses on national security, intelligence, CT, Civil Military Relations at the Nepal Army Command and South College and the Nepal Armed Force Police Force South College. He has uh, previously consulted with the National Security Council of Nepal and has been related to matters, uh, engaged in matters related to Nepal's national security since 2005. He's an alumnus of the uh, prestigious School of International and Public Affairs of Columbia University and also holds a BA in International Relations from State University of New York College at Genesee. Uh, he's an, also done executive courses on leadership and homeland security from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and on advanced security cooperation from the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Hawaii. Uh, Chiran has authored several book chapters and numerous art articles on security related issues and is uh, frequently interviewed by both Nepalese and international media on security related matters. So with the brief introduction to that very illustrious uh, resume, I would request uh, Chair to deliver this presentation. If I may, uh, do a little quick energizer so that I can keep you awake for the next 20, 25 minutes. Can I ask you all to stand up for two minutes, please? So hopefully I will keep you awake after this exercise. So I will ask each one of you to pull your right hand out. Do your signature in the air. Now, can you do the same thing with the left hand? Now, how about your head? Signature with head? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Give it a try. <laughs> now, how about with your hips? <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. So hopefully I, I, I kept you awake. I am going to keep you awake after this. Um, so the topic that was given to me uh, by my dear Sokka Bhai was understanding radicalization of youth in South Asia. Let me begin by saying this is a topic that still requires quite a bit of exploration. Um, we are still understanding a lot of variables regarding this topic. Um, there's been very little work done on it. There have been particular, there have been peculiar uh, work done on one specific country or the other, but not looking at the region as a whole. There was an effort which Shabdabai was part of and I was part of where uh, we did uh, attempt to sort of look into these issues in Kathmandu previously. Uh, so I, I, I will try to take my presentation from where we left off. So radicalization, I think uh, many of the speakers before me have already touched upon this issue. Uh, definition, I think it's, you know, various people have come up with various definitions, uh, but the one that is that is circulated around that's widely accepted or being accepted is the one by 
the UNODC that was um, um, that came out in 2012, where radicalization refers primarily to the process of indoctrination that often accompanies the transformation of recruits into individuals determined to act with violence based on extremist ideologies. So this is this is like the most uh, common definition that that is uh, in use today. But uh, this in itself is not the only definition out there. There are various de definitions, there are various interpretations of what radicalization refers to. So my beginning point is from the discussions we've had in the last <coughs> two days, I think one of the things that has become quite evident is the fact that radicalization is a, is a process. The second thing is one can be a radical but not be violent. I think we need to acknowledge that. The third thing is radicalization is not terrorism. So you can't equate radicalization with terrorism. Uh, so let's begin with these three points. Now, let's begin with youth, uh, since my topic refers to youth. Even the interpretation of youth is quite varied, and quite diverse. If you look at these, uh, you know, um, the age groups that various organizations or reputable, credible organizations around the world have uh, you know, come up with. For example, the UN uses, uses 15 to 24, the UN Habitat uses 15 to 32. UNICEF uh, has a different one. The African Youth Charter has 15 to 35. If I may ask, what does Bangladesh use as a refer point? Yes, please. 32, right. So uh, you, you will come across varying in 80 to 35, yeah. So uh, uh, the joke about Nepal is there, there's this thing called the youth leaders. And if you ask them how old they are, they're about like 55, 60, right? So they're, they're still youth leaders. Um, so as you know, like the, you know, the age group is quite uh, flexible, I should say. Now, why do we talk about youth? I, wh why is why is so much focus given to the youth? I mean, this is this is my way of looking at it because it, it's the number number game. Uh, it cons constitutes a larger section of the population, and I, I will get to it later on. It's the capabilities because youth are known to be daring. Well, those are some of the attributes that are you know back to the youth, willing to take risks. There are quite a bit of vulnerabilities associated with youth. Immature, unemployed, and experienced are some of the titles that are given to you. Um, quite negative in connotation, but I'll get to the positive part as well. They're also technologically very savvy. Uh, and one of the things, if, if, if you analyze the intersection of you, I think they have greater circles of intersections and influence, because just in terms of numbers. For me, as in my age group, the number of people that I intersect with is relatively less than someone in school or university who, and has that bigger circle. So I think uh, that is of another concern to us. And some of the youth vulnerabilities I think we all know about is there's quite a bit of expectation from the families. Uh, there's peer pressure, of course, to do well. Youth are aspirational. They have aspirations. They have you know goals. They have motivations. Uh, they have objectives. And a lot of them are, since they're just entering the job market, it is difficult for them to get employment, uh, unlike other age groups that have a certain amount of experience. And there is, as I mentioned before, there's quite a bit of risky behaviors like indulging in crime, uh, drug abuse, etc. Uh, a little bit about motivation. I think. Um, what motivates youth to become radicalized? Like, why why would they be some of the targets for recruiters? Is because I think there are s certain genuine grievances, such as deprivation, discrimination, inequality, marginalization, humiliation, etc. Uh, there's also what is happening all around the world now. Uh, you know, the access to information about what is happening in the globe today. I, I don't need to elaborate, but youth have access to information very uh, at, an inst at an instant because of uh, you know uh, the cell phones, the mobiles, we uh, the smartphones, access to news on their you know sets, 
which is quite quick. Uh, some, some, some of the research has so shown that some of the motives could also stem from money. Uh, adventure, want to be cool in front of their peers, uh, unemployment, sexual frustration. Um, these are some of the uh, you know, uh, findings of some of the research that I uh, encountered uh, as I tried to prepare, uh, prepare this presentation. There was one particular research done by University of Sussex, I think that listed sexual frustration and adventure as, as one, some of the elements that drove uh, youth towards radicalization, uh, which I found quite interesting. Uh, and the ISIS lure, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of uh, uh, the five Gs, you know, uh, what, what, what drives people, what attracts uh, youth towards ISIS uh, can be sort of categorized into these five different Gs. God, glory, guns, girls, and gold. Um, um, but ultimately, I think the feeling of injustice, whether real or perceived, and the attempt to redress injustice uh, is uh, what the youth see, like um, the of being a radical or being radicalized, is the path towards redressing some of the injustices they felt, whether it's real or uh, perceived. Um, I again broke it down into you know push factors and pull factors. Uh, you know, uh, taking um, drawing reference from Shantabai's uh, presentation yesterday. So it's pretty much the same thing that I presented earlier, uh, but you know, sort of categorized it differently. So the push factors could be social marginalization, poorly governed or ungoverned spaces, government repression, human rights violation, endemic corruption, like impunity and injustice. Uh, pull factors, resources, social status and respect for peers, sense of belonging, adventure, self-esteem or personal empowerment that individuals and groups that have long viewed themselves as being victimized and marginalized and can derive from the feeling that they are making history and the prospect of achieving glory and fame. So this, this is somewhat similar to the slide I presented earlier. Now I, I think we are all aware of this there are enablers in this environment. Communication, transportation, access to information, and all of it done quite discreetly and at a low cost. Now imagine, if you, if you I, I don't know how many of you remember, but my mother was in Sydney back in 1984. So uh, she was there for her masters. And I remember a call from Kathmandu to Sydney used to cost about 800 rupees a minute. That was the amount of cost that we had to bear to make one call for one minute. It was called a trunk call, if you remember. But now, I speak to my wife and my child almost on a daily basis, free of cost. So you can see how you know uh, communication has facilitate, facilitated that connectivity between people all around the globe at a very relatively low cost. And to be honest, it's quite discreet um, because unless you're being monitored, uh, specifically monitored, I mean, it's difficult to monitor like 168 million people in Bangladesh making calls, right, unless you are a target. So more or less, a lot of people not in the radar communicate quite discreetly. Uh, transportation, I think uh, General Munish just got back from Doha. Uh, before, I think it was quite difficult in terms of transportation as well to get around the globe. Uh, now that has become quite easy. We have direct flights to almost, uh, you know, on direct or indirect, indirect flights all all around the globe. So you you have the ability to sort of travel quite easily, and the access to information. Uh, before, uh, before my presentation, um, Aisha spoke very eloquently and elaborately. In in terms of how media has changed, how the uh, you know the landscape has changed, so uh, you know the access to information in terms of volumes uh, is uh, is out there in the internet uh, at a relatively low cost. South Asia is a very uh, complex uh, has a complex set of uh, countries, I think. 
I've, I've tried my best. I'm, I'm not going to go into detail of every single country, but I think some, uh, if you look at a glance, uh, the eight countries uh, in South Asia, almost every single country is afflicted with some level of radicalization in the various forms. Right? And the population that I was mentioning or referring to earlier about the youth population uh, is what I've put on the sideline. Afghanistan has 63% under 25. Bhutan has 46, Bangladesh has 48, India 51, Maldives 43, Nepal 52, uh, Pakistan 54, Sri Lanka 40%. So why is youth radicalization a major issue? You're talking about a significant portion of your population, almost half in most of the cases. Um, I will not dwell on the various types of radicalization in each of these countries, I think most of you are aware of, but I will uh, move forward and highlight why South Asia, I believe, is quite a vulnerable region. Um, when I was in IDSA, probably in 2010 or 11, I had worked uh, uh, with the IDSA team in terms of uh, towards a regional uh, counterterrorism strategy. There was a big conference organized by IDSA Delhi. I, I coined the term Viva Corridor. Uh, to highlight why our Asia region is quite vulnerable. And the Bipa border actually refers to the stretch all the way from Bangladesh to Pakistan, uh, to Afghanistan. So it's B, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. And at that point, some of the variables that, uh, that were there, for example, the densest concentration of Muslim, uh, Muslim population, Chronic poverty, inequality, injustice, endemic corruption, state repression, the youth bulge, and unemployment, growing youth users of social media, access to weapons, number of established extremist groups. So all of these variables combined made a very combustible mix. And when I did the research back in 2010, I think South Asia was the number one region to be affected by terrorism in terms of the numbers of those that were killed and the theater of counter-terror activities. And what we've seen over the last six, seven years is like all of these variables uh, have become quite prominent, actually. Uh, and, you know, Bangladesh endured the Gulshan attack and subsequent, uh, you know, activities after that as well. Uh, India has not actually had a major uh, event, but you know, all those elements are all there in the society. So, um, um, so for me, Viva Corridor, South Asia region is quite volatile, quite vulnerable, given that these variables are present. So, what are some of the signs? Um, some of the identified signs of radicalization uh, that um, someone referred to in the previous presentation as well was. A sense of detachment from normal activities, from friends, family, uh, being secretive, um, and having that us versus them mentality, questioning one's identity, downloading and propagating extremist contents, intolerant of competing viewpoints, and abnormal routines. These are some identified signs, but these may not just be some of the indicators. There may be a lot more than this. But these have been identified as some of the, uh, some of the signs uh, for uh, youth radicalization. And I have put a small disclaimer at the bottom saying that displaying all or any of these attitudes and behaviors may not necessarily be subject to ra radicalization. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't mean that one is radicalized just because of these signs. But these are, these are some of the signs to watch out for. Spaces, I think, so where does one get radicalized? Is there a particular space? Is there a particular time? Um, and some of the spaces uh, I tried to identify are listed here. Um, I think, I believe, I believe that, you know, one can get radicalized almost anywhere and everywhere. The reason I, 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 I say this, or the reason I assert this, this is, I, I mentioned this previously uh, in the last workshop as well. When I was in Bangladesh uh, doing some research on uh, you know, some conflict issues, 
one of the things I came across was a few of the respondents told me that they were approached by people in public uh, vehicles, like in uh, buses, where they tried to, you know, sort of uh, give radical con contents and tried to start a conversation. So there was an effort made by someone in the public transport system to try to radicalize someone. And um, I, I, I interviewed like two people that uh, said this. So I think at this point, most of the literature suggests that most of the radicalization is taking place in cyberspace, especially because the youth are spending so much more time in cyberspace rather than on playgrounds or in uh, other places. Then the second uh, space is academic institutions where you know the rest of their time is spent in schools, universities, colleges. Places of religious wor worship is another place, prisons, uh, because um, if you if you look at uh, the statistics, I think most of the inmates in most of the prisons around the world are from a certain age category, and a lot of them are youth. Uh, and of course, workplaces and other public places. Uh, cyber radicalization, I think, is the most uh, critical topic for youth radicalization today because, as you all know, that youth are increasingly spending a lot more time on the cyberspace. And the reason this has become a topic of great interest to us is because it's a space that's went infinite. It's easily accessible, it's affordable, it's discreet. Uh, how many of you know about the dark web? Yeah. So, um, there, can any, any of you, do you want to describe what a dark web is? Uh, the dark web, the mass is transmitted to the people who belong to the radical groups because so that these informations are not informed to others, to those who all are not involved in this way or in this part or in this group. So there are these uh, very discreet, uh, it's a very discreet space within the you know, cyber domain where you can communicate, you can share information uh, in a very discreet manner, only between, so there's a sort of a membership. So you have to be a member of that particular group to be able to access that kind of information or to communicate. So that it's done in a way whereas you avoid detection. Um, and the other thing about cyber radicalization is the amount of volumes. Imagine if you had to transfer or transmit uh, you know, 15 different books or volumes um, to a certain someone. The cost of carrying it around with you, the cost of transporting is very difficult. But in the cyberspace, it's not just 50 books. You have you, you can store an enormous amount of data in the cyberspace at a relatively low cost and very easy. So um, this this has become a space that's increasingly utilized by ra uh, you know, radical recruiters. And there is also little barriers or deterrence. I think the space is so enormous it is very difficult for government agencies to keep a close eye on every single individual. Um, and there are spaces like the dark web where you know uh, it makes it even more difficult for enforcement agencies or those that are monitoring that kind of communication and that kind of uh, you know uh, uh, discussions. So uh, the reason one of the enablers of cyber, cyber radicalization is also. Uh, because of the, you know, that there are no barriers of deterrence. The example I want to give you is, for example, when you, when you enter any space, any country, like in terms of boundaries, when you have immigration, right? When you fly into any airport, you have a very strict immigration. Uh, you know, they check where you're from, they check your passport, they check your identity, they, the custom checks what kind of, you know, items that you brought to the country or what you're taking back, whatever. But do you think we, do you think there is anything comparable in the cyber domain, right? So, not to the extent that we do in terms of you know actual boundaries. So, that's one of the reasons why you know cyber radicalization has become quite the norm because of these elements. Uh, 
uh, types. I should have mentioned this earlier, but you know, radicalization is. Um, I mentioned in my previous presentation. I mean, the discourse of countering violent extremism is a bit skewed because it only sees one one particular element, uh, which is you know the Islamic version of uh, extremism, but. Uh, most of us tend to forget that there are other forms of radicalization, other forms of extremism, such as the right-wing extremism, left-wing extremism, and there are issue-based ex extremisms as well. Uh, have you heard of the environmentalists uh, in the U.S. who have gone around, you know, burning houses, uh, doing quite a bit of damage to property? Uh, so that that is another form of, you know, um, radicalism that you know we've we encounter. Um, so it's like anti-immigration, anti-abortion, anti-gay. There was there, there was a shooting of one of the one of the doctors who was uh, involved in abortion in the U.S., which was a big case because the guy that uh, shot the doctor was you know um, one of the radicals who uh, didn't believe in abortion. So you know you have these radicals that take up these issues as well. I think there are three types of, uh, if, if you were to categorize people in terms of what kind of radicals are there um, and their, the, the intensity of their involvement or uh, we, can, we can basically categorize into these three, uh, three categories, inspired, instructed, and inducted. So you have these inspired guys uh, that are not necessarily affiliated with any network. Uh, mostly acting alone, all, all, often referred to as lone wolves. Um, then there are instructed ones that are not necessarily part of the group uh, or have never actually met the group but have some level of affiliation or association with a particular group. And then there are those uh, particular uh, individuals that are part of the group. So uh, I've tried to sort of categorize the radical elements into three groups. Now in terms of the response, like I was thinking of it like, I don't necessarily have an answer as to what can be done about, what should be done about uh, youth radicalization. But looking at it from a macro level, I think, I, just as the previous speakers have said, it requires a holistic approach, it requires a comprehensive approach. So it can't just be uh, one uh, one pronged approach where only the law enforcement agencies or the security agencies are involved. Um, so I sort of categorize into polit political, economic, social, and security. Uh, the political side of it, I think, is uh, responsible for diversifying opportunities and options. Um, that it, it's a broader, uh, you know, it's it's a broader definition in terms of. Uh, when I say diversified opportunities and options, uh, because what we're essentially trying to do is trying to ensure that you know discrimination doesn't uh, exist. There's no marginalization. There's no deprivation. Um, so all the, and there's equal opportunities for everyone in the society. Uh, you know there's diversity. So that is sort of uh, how the political prism should look at. And the economic side of it is there's always this uh, argument that you know development both in terms of socioeconomic de development is one of the responses uh, in combating uh, radicalization uh, because of the you know the elements such as de deprivation. And the social side of it is whenever we talk about youth radicalization, so what is the first point of contact or, or, or the first sphere for any youth? It's the family, right? So the family plays a very important role. Uh, the teachers, uh, the mentors, Friends, uh, the society that the person lives in has a huge role to play in this uh, equation because they they are the ones that can play a very positive role in terms of trying to shape uh, this environment and the person. Uh, of course, uh, the security approach is always meant to detect, de degrade, and destroy uh, because that is somewhat the level of mandate the security agencies have, and I think right now the general perception uh, has slowly shifted, but that 
that sort of sense of responsibility still hasn't come towards the society at the society level. Um, I was glad to hear yesterday uh, someone mentioned about how Bangladesh has been able to prevent uh, you know a lot of these violent acts because of the involvement of the society. Uh, that you know the people in the community are responding, they're you know, informing the government authorities. I was very happy to hear that, but I think in general, in terms of discourse, I, I still believe, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, the other, other, other speakers, we still see that responsibility, we're, we're given that responsibility just to the government, or especially to you know, the intelligence agencies or uh, the security forces. We, we say that, you know, terrorism, radicalism, it's the responsibility of these guys, they will take care of it. I think that is still the case in most of Here are some of the points that I thought, you know, just speaking, listening to a lot of the speakers before me, and uh, um, I, I was lucky because I could derive a lot of lessons from ev everyone's, you know, presentation. So I, I just added this over lunch. Uh, one of the things that I felt was we we are talking about solutions. We're trying to figure out what can be done, what would be the best way forward, and. I should actually comment you that I see quite a bit of youth in this room, but whenever we go to a lot of these conferences, they're, they're, they are absent. Uh, so I'm, I'm very glad there is a good participation, you know, you know, both in terms of gender and in terms of age. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll be youth for another 10 years, so. But yeah, I think the response should always include the youth in trying to come up with solutions. Uh, most of the solutions, most of the most of the strategies, most of the, most of the counterterrorism strategies ha ha have been drafted, as we both know, and most of you know, by specialists that are not from that age. So it's it's uh, I think that would be a good way forward is to involve or engage the youth in trying to come up with solutions. Um, this was uh, something that was that came out quite prominently in the discussion was. We don't have enough counter narratives. There is an enormous amount of, uh, you know, uh, fodder that is out there for uh, that is put out by the radicals. I think Samir mentioned this. Like every hour, there is I don't know 300 pages or 300 new websites or 300 new uh, whatever it was and that is put out there by uh, ISIS or these radical elements. And how much of it do we put out? Um, are we matching that? I think that is something that. Uh, we need to think about, of course, raise awareness and raise preparedness is always like a big theme like about these issues, which most came about in the previous discussion. And providing platforms where constructive discussions and debates can be had. Uh, I think this is um, an example of where we can bring youth, uh, we can bring specialists from you know, security forces, uh, society, uh, other members of society. We have these dialogues and discussions so that we can come up with constructive solutions together instead of, you know, like a siloed approach from like a security point of view or the youth point of view. Or so bringing together all these voices, I think, is uh, quite necessary. Uh, and I couldn't agree more, you know, uh, with what Shankarbhai mentioned. More research, of course. I think there's still um, quite, a, quite a lot that we need to understand about this issue. Um, there hasn't been enough research, and it's it's quite sensitive and it's quite difficult. For example, um, in the South Asian context, my my title in my current uh, organization is I'm the regional security advisor for South Asia, uh, for for Asia. So I have 15 countries under my portfolio, and I travel quite a bit. And I try not to whenever at the immigration, I try not to use that security word. Because it still seemed in a very, uh, in a suspicious manner. Um, so here's this guy. He says he's security. Like, and this has happened to me at the immigration here as well. So when they say security, they immediately sort of refer to their boss. Okay? He has security. In it. So that word in itself, uh, as you know, in the South Asian context, uh, is viewed differently. Because I think we still believe that the word security only implies to the security agencies, and the responsibility is, uh, you know, basically uh, put on the security agencies. Uh, 
series strategy, which I presented in the last presentation as well uh, here in this room, and I will, uh, you know, repeat it. I think overall, what we're trying to do is to increase tolerance, increase resilience, and increase vigilance. Uh, we we we're trying to make the societies more tolerant so that we don't uh, have these radical elements. We're trying to be stronger, even if uh, you know these radical elements exist. We can accommodate, or even even in in terms of attacks, we're still ready to absorb it, and it's not going to make that much of a change in our societies. And to remain vigilant, I think uh, that is another element that has to be thrown in there because um, one, one of the things I noticed, um, uh, I was speaking to my uh, colleague from uh, who went to Columbia as well. So one of the things I noticed 10 years down the line in New York City was there's quite a bit of like security cameras on every single block. Every single household has a you know security camera installed. So this is this is the changing you know context that we're you know uh, we're we're living through. And even in Nepal now, I mean, uh, if I may mention, there are, because now we have 24 hours of electricity, there are a lot more security cameras uh, you know across the cities. Um, it's it's becoming a trend. Uh, so that sort of adds to vigilance. And I think people are also becoming a little bit more aware uh, of the things to look out for. And I think this is because the awareness level has been built um, to a certain extent. Um, again, uh, the CV strategy to dissuade, detect, defeat, and disengage. Um, the three things that really matter is in terms of motivation, uh, the capability and the opportunity for any radical or any extremist. We've, I've uh, explained earlier in my slides about what motivates people. Um, one of the strategies that we try to sort of uh, emphasize is to sort of curb that motivation, to sort of clip that motivation so that there's no motivation to begin with. So create that environment where the motivation is clear. and you go a bit uh, into the next step where you might have the motivation, but you might not have the capability. So you might have the intent to sort of maybe you know, mount an attack uh, in one of, one of the places, which would probably require quite a bit of planning, quite a bit of resources, uh, guns maybe, like ammunition. But if we create that environment where people don't have access to those, uh, uh, access to those variables, for example, in the UK, for example, why isn't there as many killings as there are in the United States? Because the gun gun laws are very strict. You don't have access to them. Um, whereas in the US, access to guns uh, quite easy, uh, part of the Constitution. So, uh, so one, one of the things that we want to look at is to sort of limit that capability of someone who's motivated. And the third thing is to limit that person from getting that opportunity uh, to make sure our, uh, our public spaces are not that vulnerable. Um, I think one of the recent uh, developments in uh, you know, uh, that we have witnessed across Europe and across a lot of other places is the tactical innovation that uh, the extremists have come up with. Um, for example, plowing, like driving a car into crowds. Uh, which we saw in Paris, which we saw in many other places. Now, how do you sort of stop someone from driving a car into a crowd? Can it actually be done? Can, can you actually stop someone from, uh, you know, owning a car? Can you, uh, is, is that possible? Any of you have any answers to that? Like, can, can something be done about that? Right. Very little. But there are certain things, like you, you can still have some obstructions for that. For example, across Europe and across some cities in the US, they're now looking at creating these metal barriers on sidewalks. Uh, I'm sure you've seen that, uh, concrete barriers that uh, sort of prevent the cars from going into sidewalks. So as the extremists become innovative, I think we too, should start exploring options, try to be more innovative and come up with solutions. 
And these are some of the questions that I thought that, you know, I don't have answers to everything. But these are questions I think we all need to collectively try to answer together. Is who is actually responsible for de-radicalization? Do we actually know which entity? Like how do we de-radicalize people? And what does that process involve? Uh, there's a lot of you know psychological, uh, psychosocial counseling that is involved. And the question yesterday that we sort of discussed briefly is about prisons. Like when you apprehend a uh, someone that's an extremist, that's a radical, and use uh, you know uh, go through the, the legal process, apprehend the guy, go through courts. Um, sentence this guy and send him to the prison system. Are we doing justice? Are, are, is, is that the right way forward? Because could prison be another space where that person could radicalize actually 15 more people? So that is, that, that, that is something that we need to uh, you know, carefully answer. And what are the costs that we're willing to incur in this process? Because de-radicalization or any like counter extreme uh, CV uh, work requires money. Even this, uh, you know, workshop. Even you know, people traveling from one place to the other. Every call you make, uh, although you know, you, you can say the fiber doesn't cost me money, but you're still paying your, uh, you know, your service provider for the internet. So there, there are costs associated with every single action that we take. So what is, what is, what is, what is the optimal amount that we're willing to incur so that we can still go ahead with all these activities such as economic development. You uh, upliftment of the poor, uh, and still do this kind of work. And what if this process doesn't work? What if we realize in the end we were wrong all along? Uh, you know, we, we, we thought this, this was the right way forward, and we realize that this is, this is, not, this is actually not working. So we need to prepare for these uh, contingencies, I think. And with that, brings to the end of my uh, presentation. Thank you for listening. I know it was difficult after lunch. Um, I hope I kept most of you away. Some of you I, I saw almost sort of dozed off, but that's okay. Thank you.